Hello and welcome to Bandwidth Conversations, a podcast that finds out about the stories and journeys of artists, performers and rock stars of life. I am Katie Brewer and my guest today needs no introduction, but here it is anyway. A master of both drama and comedy, he is a theatre, film and television actor. In 2015, he won the BAFTA for Best Lead Actor in the Lost Honor of Christopher Jeffries about the innocent initial suspect and the 2010 murder of Joanna Yates. He played Prime Minister Harold Wilson in The Crown. He played the biographer of a serial killer in Dez. He's in McDonald and Dodds, Line of Duty, Trolleyed, W1A, Are You Being Served, Taboo, A Very English Scandal. The list goes on and on, and I had to conclude that my guest is in just about every program that's any good. <laughs> Regarding films, he was in Bridget Jones, Tomorrow Never Dies, The Golden Compass, all three of the Nativity films, and Wild Child, to name but a few. As a family, we voted Nativity as the funniest Christmas film of all time, and we watch it every year. And meanwhile, I'm too embarrassed to admit the number of times my daughters have watched Wild Child. <laughs> <laughs> He's patron of the fantastic charity, Child Bereavement UK, and it is through them that I'm lucky enough to be talking to him today. What you may not know is that in addition to all of this, he has the most extraordinary talent of being able to walk on his hands. I've been really looking forward to talking today to Jason Watkins. Hello, Jason. Hello, Katie. Thank you. What, a, what an introduction. Thank you for having me. So you grew up in Shropshire? Yeah, yeah. Can you please paint a picture of your childhood? Yes. I went back there recently, actually. I was filming in, in Dudley. And I used to talk like that, you know, when I came to London when I was eight. I lived in Albrighton, which is uh, it's a sort of little village outside of um, Wolverhampton. And it's a kind of one of those typical English villages in that it's got an, an old part and a new part. And the old part was a sort of a high street with, you know, a pond and you know, sort of lawns either side of the single road. And then the, the modern bit. I was born in the modern bit. My mother's from Manchester and my father. I'm just about to do a sort of documentary a bit about my father because he's quite an interesting guy. My father was adopted, and I might get emotional about it now that I'm on mic, you know, because it's quite a story in a way, because he was adopted, and a librarian who was married had an affair with the assistant librarian in Eltham in London in 1930. And she went to her local doctor, and uh, he said, well, why don't you, you know, go on holiday, as it were, up to Cleethorpes in Lincolnshire, where he knew another GP. So that's where my grandmother, Margaret, gave birth to my dad. And then he was brought up by the doctors in the surgery. He was taken in by the family who lived and worked above the doctor's surgery. He was bride. And he never saw his father again, I don't think. And his mum, my grandmother, used to come up occasionally and I never met her. And he got to Cambridge. Wow. He went to a small private school and he got to Cambridge to read natural sciences. It's one of those things that he'd never talk about, but I was always sort of proud of him, but I'm even more, I mean, he passed away in June of last year. He talked a little bit about Cambridge. I mean, he, went, he was there when Alan Bennett was doing, you know, the Oh my goodness, and, yes. So it's exactly that time, Jonathan Miller, uh, that group. And, and I think uh, Peter Cook, Dudley Moore, were they part of it? I'm not sure, but there was the Footlights at that time. So he was part of that generation. And, you know, he was just a sort of scientist, specialist, a metals expert and a uh, welding expert, but it took him all over the world. And but he started in Wolverhampton, a company called Marston's, which was uh, his first job, a job in Oldham. And then that's why we moved to this village. Then we moved to London, yeah, when I was eight. So, yes. I read that you're dyslexic, yeah. um, which now is absolutely fine and everyone understands it and you're tested for it and you're taught differently. But in our day, the people who then ended up being dyslexic were just thought of as being thick oh, at the yeah, time. Oh, yeah, definitely. I was in that group. And were you? <laughs> was that how you were treated? It was thicko. When I came to London, my parents are bright, mother's a teacher, dad's an engineer, you know, but what, what, you got a bit of a dud here, you know, or, you know, so it was all, <laughs> oh, that's so it horrible. Was, <laughs> nobody ever said that. I don't think, well, there's certainly lots of a face. Because you're also a footballer, weren't you? Was that your first love before acting? Yeah, I was, as a good sprinter, second in the borough. So the borough of Hounslow. Oh my gosh, that's, that's really good. Yeah, I was quick. And, uh, but there was always one guy that beat me called Lee Stanton. Funny how you remember no, his name, No, of course you do. And I actually met all those guys I play football with after 40 years. I met them all like about a month ago. Did you? And his name was mentioned not only by me, Lee Stanton. So you're out there, Lee. Well done. 
I was really good and at, at sport and, and rather freakish at gymnastics, yeah, or walking on my hands. So when did you start becoming interested in more formal drama? I was really lucky in the school I went to. I went to Hounslow Manor Comprehensive School, which is now called the Kingsley Academy. And so it was a, a state school. I, you know, I really enjoyed my time there. And I think later on, someone said, oh, God, blimey, do you remember that shit hole, you know? Mm-mm. Pardon my language. But, you know, <laughs> and I thought, no, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't think that. I was deputy head boy, which is partly through sport. And I got on with people. But in terms of my work, I just couldn't, you know, I, I still do. I still buy these books. That I really want to read. And I, I don't read them because I find it so hard to concentrate. But then how do you learn your lines? Well, that's easy because that's work. And sitting down at home and learning your lines, that's as thrilling as doing the performing. Because you're making creative decisions. You know, you string the lines together as, in a story and you're trying to think, what am I thinking? You know, where am I going? Well, usually I have a week where I, I start learning and top it up every day for a week. So I'm completely in control of it by the time I can perform it. And by in control, I mean so much so that you can just listen to everybody else and then react like a tune, you know, it's in your head. And then that's when, you know, you're always trying to find the magic, really, which is what's been said to me by a director. I did Taboo, which you mentioned earlier on, you read these three weird kind of Scandinavian directors who were brilliant, deliberately so, because I think Tom Hardy and the team were thinking about who should we get to direct it. And, the, you know, there are lots of the bridge and all those kind of stinks, shows are around. And so they brought them in. So it gave it another flavor. It was a very clever concoction that they created. And that ingredient was the director. And he said, where's the magic? Do it again, you know. And you think, well, yeah, you, you know, you can, if you try, right, I'm going to be, take a few risks and be a bit weird with this or do something that is magical. Because why not? You can't settle for the mundane. You can't settle for the fulfilling the job. You've got to be creative. It's got to matter so much and magic can happen. And then there's a point in doing it. You know, well, I'm lucky that I'm in that sort of job. Don't lose out on the joy of that. Don't treat it like you're selling potatoes. Yeah, <laughs> because, you know, a lot of people are and they'd rather be doing what you're doing. Yeah, so the dyslexia kind of led me towards sport and then acting, just pretending. And I always be able to do funny voices and mimicking. And in fact, I did mimic a dinner lady at Marlborough School, not the Marlborough. She said, she went, everybody up to the playground now. And it was obvious. I mean, where were we going to go? We weren't going to go anywhere else. <laughs> We'd had our lunch. We were going up to the playground. I went, everybody up to the playground now. <laughs> And she heard me and said, titties. And she dragged me into the headmaster, Mr. Finney, dragged me into the headmaster's office. It's funny what you remember. And I remember going through the, the sort of reception where the secretaries were. And I remember the secretary pulling up tights up, like, you know. Well, while I, you were there. Well, just because we burst in and she was, then there's nothing going on. I'm not besmirching Mr. Finney or her, but it was, it was like, it was all part of the thing. Was <laughs> in <out> quick, like, <laughs> door opened. And then. He said, would you do that sort of thing at home? And I thought about it. And um, to this day, I don't know why. I said, yes. <laughs> and he, he whacked me on the thigh, as they did then. Yes, they could. In our little shorts. And that afternoon was the uh, swimming gala. So I had this massive blue handprint on my thigh while I was doing this, while well, I was coming second again, probably in the breaststroke. Yes, I was mimicking people getting into trouble. And then I think I did the school play in primary school, then primary school, just the sort of nativity. Uh, no, it was Wizard of Oz it was, and I played the wizard. But then jumping ahead a bit, I had to sport, sport mad, every sport, played cricket for the borough, cricket, football for the borough. I think I played for London one once, and I ended up going to the English schools and stuff like that. I wish at that time I could have been more applied. I wish I had a slightly different psychological makeup that, you know, I could have done that. If I'd been single-minded, become a footballer, I could have done it. I was really good at like 14 and 15. I would have loved to have been a footballer, you know, even pre the pay packets they get now. But to have that life, I would have really loved it. And I suppose that I'm not alone in that, you know. But I did get reasonably close and I ended up playing semi-professional football for a while before I went to RADA. What sparked your, your move to RADA? I had really two really brilliant teachers. Yvonne Payne, who was my drama teacher at GCSE or uh, O-Levels at that time, and Tom Sweeney, who was at Heathland School, which was a sort of sister school in Cranford, 
which they did A-level drama. They didn't do that at House mm-hmm. Manor. So I was doing the school plays, you know, I did Oliver in my first year. And I really, I still can't sing very well. I remember being out of key, basically, in Where Is Love. <laughs> uh, I'm really sweetly, sweetly singing all the wrong notes at the start. <laughs> and people, I could, I've pictured people with tears in their eyes at the begin, at the, on the front row. And I always thought that, ah, oh, you know, they look like, because I was so cute. I had all this hair, believe it or not, blue eyes, blonde hair. But they were probably crying because, <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Why was I 12? I had a bit of a soft spot for Nancy, who was in the sixth form. I was quite ambitious in that respect. Setting your sights very high. I think I was laughed at, yeah. But I, I didn't care. You know, I remember having a little sort of soft spot for her. I'm requited, obviously. Yes, yeah, school plays. And then, I, you know, the option was to do sort of more formal things. And I think that's where teachers really come in and where they play their part. So... I couldn't do English. I, you know, I read about two books in my whole, you know, you know, I found it so hard to read. So I love people. I love watching them. I do like spending time, I'm a bit of a recluse sometimes, but I do like people. I have to know how they tick. My parents were sort of heading for a divorce and, you know, I don't know how happy the marriage was and they didn't get on. And when they did divorce, they didn't speak to each other after that. And, you Gosh, know, that's hard for you. Yeah, really. And, uh, but, you know, that's life. Uh, maybe that got me in curious about people and, and about what they thought and what one's motives were. And so it's not just what you're thinking, it's how you think. And often that, I would think, even at that age, that would dictate how you walked and how you moved and what you're, you know, and all those sorts of things. I just was all sort of going in. And I impersonated the whole of the cricket team that I played for, Wickham House. So on a Saturday night, I'd... I'd impersonate all of them from the opener and, you know, these funny little tips. And <laughs> it was always there, you know. We ended up doing the cherry orchard in for A-level. We did an exercise where you had to storyboard it. And I loved that. And I really understood that. And I think it helped me understand filmmaking later on. So I thank Mr, you know, Tom Sweeney, who I still am in contact with. Oh, that's so nice. Yeah, yeah. After I won the BAFTA, he contacted me and then we've sort of, pinged things backwards and forwards and I have thanked him for what he did and, and Yvonne. My husband Simon was at Clifton, which I'm going to oh, go right. back to. He was at the same time as Simon Russell Beale. Okay. And, and yeah. one of the English teachers, not Christopher Jeffries, really pushed back against Simon's parents who were really not wanting him to go down the route of acting. So he really worked hard for Simon and thank goodness for yeah, the yeah. rest of us that he did. When was that moment where you thought, okay, I'm going to apply to RADA? And how did your parents respond to that? I was always losing my key. My parents had divorced when I was 14. My father had moved not far away, Twickenham, and my mum was teaching. I remember that I'd locked myself out again and I walked up to the Great West Road, which is that main artery that goes out of, you know, out from, from Cromwell Road and carries on out towards the airport. Obviously, it really failed in my exams. I mean, my, I got five O levels, which is a miracle. And then I'd got two A levels, both D. So I got, I got, I got art and drama. I still sort of wanted to play football, but I'd been sort of distracted by, you know, I wasn't, as I said, that sort of single mindedness. I wish I'd had. But I had been doing acting and I really enjoyed it. I did walk up to the Great West Road at night and I sat down on one of the benches next to the cycle lane, which then overlooks the, the motorway and I saw these people coming out in their cars driving back and the light was fading and it was you know the lights their headlights were on and I did think then I don't want to be one of those people that's an important thought to have and I was what was I 18 18, yeah I thought I don't want to do that they're like I was they're like chains you know it's like so I went back home and I said to my mum I said right I want to go to drama school and she went oh my god Because it's so precarious. To be fair to her, she probably wanted me to have a a profession. And certainly my dad did. And he never understood, really, quite what it was that I do. So I applied for drama school. I was very single-minded. And I'd watched these play for today's. And one of them, Yvonne Payne said to me, you should do Iago, do some Iago, my Shakespeare piece. But the modern piece... I'd watched a play for today called The Man Who Thought He Was Eamon Andrews. It's about a guy who's sort of a fantasist, you know. It's a sad little loser guy, basically. 
And he'd say, the first line of the whole play was, have you got the Colgate ring of confidence? I haven't. And he'd go off on that and there'd be bits, as a rock star of world renown, do you feel that playing Hamlet is something that you should be doing, whatever, to Eamon Andrews? So he'd be interviewed, but so he's a fantasist, basically. Anyway, this is brilliant speech. So I wrote off to the BBC and I said, is there a script? And the, it wasn't published, but they sent me a camera script, which is basically just the script with cues and camera positions and stuff like that. I got into Bristol and I got into RADA. Okay. I think I just wanted to stay in London, really, so I chose RADA. How did you enjoy it when you were there? Yeah, I mean, it was just amazing. The teachers were incredible, you know, and ex exotic and strict ballet teachers. And Joan Washington, she was a great late wife of uh, Richard E. Grant. You know, she was there teaching us accents. I mean, my goodness. Alan Bennett came in and directed one of his uh, habeas corpus for a couple of weeks at the start of the rehearsal process. Tessa Marwick, who was this sort of rather mystical person, teacher, guru-like weird so lots of weird stuff as well as former stuff and david perry who was a taught restoration comedy so and then those old voice teachers like the guy who taught margaret thatcher how to lower her voice he was there robert palmer and so there was a mixture of teachers one student who sort of showed me around said you know they're going to throw lots of balls at you you can't juggle them all but make sure you catch some of them which is really good advice I could have easily got overwhelmed at all. I don't, did you know this? I got my acceptance letter to get into RAD. So I'm in my house. So my father was traveling the world. So he bought me a back, these sort of, I bought the, this was wearing this kimono in the morning, you know, as I was 18, had Mark Spencer slippers on, these ta green tanning flare pajamas and this cheap, <laughs> cheap silk thing. Goodness, yeah, what a sight. And waiting for the letters to come, you know. So on this particular morning, I think it was September and it was bright, one of those autumn days. Then the light was sort of streaming in through the house. I went down to the middle level, it was open plan. I looked down onto the mat and there was this white envelope strobing, you know, with these red letters. So I went down and we had this little cat called Jacob that was always sort of messing around, flipping about, playing with the flares of these pajamas. And I went down and picked up the letter and it said, you know, Royal Academy of Dramatic Art on the outside. I said, oh my God, this is it. And then and the cat was filling around. So I went upstairs again onto the middle level opened the envelope and dear Jason Watkins, I'm very glad to offer you a place at the Royal Academy. So, cause I played a lot of football, I jumped in the air, landed on the cat and, oh. <laughs> and killed it. No way. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I'm just looking at you now, Katie, realizing that, that your, your house is full of pictures of animals, but. <laughs> no, um, but you didn't do it on purpose. No, I didn't. So I killed the cat. Oh my gosh, that is, yeah. well, that is such a shame on, on lots of levels, but, you know, happiness to sadness yeah. in, in, in a, in a moment. yes. Yeah, poor thing, Jacob flipped around and then, and then did, did die in front of me. Oh my gosh. And all this fur sort of, you know, coming cascading down in, again, the beams of light and this fur sort of settling on the ground. And my mother came down and said, what is it? What is it? I said, I've got into Rada and I've killed the cat. So, so <laughs> that's how you said it. In that order. Yeah. Yeah. So that was a funny old start. That's my grand An inauspicious, <laughs> inauspicious start to great yeah, things. That's the word. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Um, Where well, do you go from moving there? swiftly on. Just to mention briefly, our term, we had a really good term. So Ray Fiennes, Ian Glenn, Imogen Stubbs, uh, Jane Horrocks, you know. Who you then work with. Yeah. Later on. Yeah. So they're all, you know, lots of very successful term. Janet McTeer was there and Sean Bean was, they were leaving as we were coming in. Our particular term was a really, really strong one. And I had, a, as I said, a wonderful time. I suppose I didn't have much confidence, I suppose, really. I mean, I didn't, I really didn't. So I started by doing fringe theatre. So I did lots of above pubs. Were your sights more on the stage or on the screen? Stage, you know, that was what I enjoyed. And uh, I think the first thing I did a reading at the Orange Tree Theatre. We just had our 40 year anniversary of when we went to RADA. Most of us got together and had a fantastic evening at Imogen's place. And it was amazing. And it's so nice when you meet at that point. I think if you'd have met a few years late after you have leave, like 10 years later, it's difficult. Some people are doing well, others might find it, whatever. But now you think, you know, it doesn't matter, whatever. No, it doesn't matter. Well, it's you've all life. done incredibly well. There's a sort of love with people that, that you're bonded for life. 
And the same with my football guys as well. The friendships that you make when you're young, you're lucky if, when they'll come back again later on. But if you can hang on to them, particularly the ones you really connect with, even if they have a completely different life to yours and you go into a different thing, I would always try and hang on to them because I wish I had. And it's only now, I suppose, I wish I'd done that. But that's just life, I suppose. Well, I think there is something lovely about those old friendships because whatever you've done in your life, people stay as they are when you first meet them. And the way that you behave stays the same as when you first meet them. So that every, so even though we're all terribly serious now and we've got lots of responsibilities and things, and that does sort of change things a little bit. When you go back to meeting those friends from a long time ago, you can be an absolute idiot again, because that's, it was in those, those carefree days. Yeah, exactly. And you, we think we, you know, we might think we get more sophisticated or we no, we don't move really. in different we just circles. About. Oh, look at ours, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm appearing at the National Theatre. <laughs> and then you go back and you, you, I remember talking talk to Andy Murray. Uh, no, it's Keith Murray, sorry. Lovely Keith. We played football all the time. He was t- talking to me and he was telling me a story. And he was doing that thing that he always did when he made loads of eye contact. He got right in and he spoke to you. And he used to do that when he was a, when he was a young man. I thought, there he is again, <laughs> this guy that I, you know, and he was like a, like a child. It was, it was wonderful, you know. And I'm glad that I've got a memory for those things as well. I always I remember those things than anything else. And that was, that was a lovely moment amongst many, actually. And that was really nice. Damien Lewis said that his Hollywood moment when he went to L.A. and they said, you are going to be Major Dick Winters in Steven Spielberg's Band of Brothers. And these friends that I'm in a band with, Steve Overland, the, the lead singer, said when he was going around bars in, and pubs in Hammersmith playing to nobody, and then he'd walk past the Hammersmith Apollo and he'd see you know, the Who or the Rolling Stones or whoever. And he's just like, wow, that's where I want to be. And then the moment he was the headline, he sort of had that moment of, how did I get here? So a sublime career moment. There are two, really. There's one, which is a slightly lesser one, which was when I was a semi-professional footballer, my manager then, Mickey Clark, was an SA at Pinewood. And he was one of those guys that you'd often see in, in films at that, that, at that time. They'd trust certain essays to sit in a boardroom in a James Bond film or something because they could look after themselves and they were professional extras, but really featured and, and could act a bit and would be underplay everything. And, and he knew that I was into acting and he invited, he, he got me along. So I watched Octopussy being filmed and I think it was Louis Jordan or Alan Delon, but his dark hair, very dark hair, and the lights, it was in a casino, the set was in a casino. They put me on at the back of the set, and I could just see, and he, he was so quiet, he sort of whispered his lines. It was silent. The way he was lit, his eyes were like glistening. He was throwing the dice, and it was, all, it was really magical. And I just, I do remember that. So there have been times when I've gone on to big sets at Pinewood and gone, my God, I'm here. I'm the one. Yeah. It's me. It's me. Or, you know, yeah, in The Crown, for example, some huge set, or, you know, or, or sitting opposite Olivia or something. In yes. The so there's that one. That was, and that's a nice memory. And then also I went to see a play called A Map of the World at the National Theatre. I went with my mum who took me and my grandmother I think somebody took the clothes off in the first few minutes when naked and my grandmother mother just went oh I don't reckon much to this <laughs> <laughs> the first thing she said <laughs> and she must have closed her eyes for the rest of the, the show but the play is about a map of the world and it's a play a David Hare play about basically in one's map of the world do you have a utopia a vision of the world that you would like to see some people don't he would argue. I think his argument was it's really important that you do, and even if it's imperfect. And Bill Nye comes on and does this speech, probably because he was blonde, like I was when I had hair. And he'd bang this speech out in the centre stage at the National Theatre at the Olivier. Might have been the little snatchling. And it was magic. Yeah, magic. He was a bit of a bad boy at the time. And which he's talked about. But for whatever reason, he was bold and risk-taking and sort of, you know, 
just young, you know, young and, and full of energy and didn't give a fuck. And he's like, bang, knocking it out. It was amazing. And I did think, I want to do that. And I've seen him since and I told him. So that was nice. I bumped into him. I like Margaret Howe clothes and I like her shirts, particularly I did at that time. Uh, I do now, but at that time, that was the thing that got me. So I used to go, if I got a pay packet, I'd go there on Wigmore Street and get myself a nice shirt. And I, there was Bill Nye. And God bless him. I was talking to him and he said, oh, do you want to go for a walk? So we walked around the block a few times and he told me about his struggles. You know, he, he'd had problems with alcohol and stuff. And I told him that, you know, he'd inspired me. And so that was a, that was a big moment. That's a lovely, lovely moment. Okay, I have to ask you about Christopher Jeffries. Okay, yeah. Because you were just extraordinary in it. So Simon was at Clifton. He was one of those horrible, horrible boys that would be making Christopher's life hell in the classroom, at the back, you know, making fun, just being awful. So I should say, for those who don't know, there was this absolutely horrific murder of Joanna Yates and the initial suspect was Christopher Jeffries, who was her landlord. And turns out that actually it was another tenant who, who murdered her. But the press had a field day and really ripped him apart. So I, at the time, said, I cannot believe that he would have done anything like this. Then it was proven that he hadn't had anything to do with it. And then he watched the film and he came out and he just couldn't stop saying, you just don't get that Jason has him 100%. He said, it's his voice, it's the way he stands, it's his mannerisms, it's even the way his gestures, the way he holds his hands, the way he holds his fingers. It was him. I was watching him. And everybody in his cohort, when they were talking about it, said, said exactly the same. So how did you do that? Isn't it funny that when we came here to your house and you showed me a particular thing you've got on the wall, and it was by somebody who, who was in a bit of a crisis at the time. And yes. it was an amazing creation that, that had come out of a crisis. Really. So that was certainly a, a, an element. I'm, I'm st I don't want to start this on a down, but we'd lost our daughter. So, uh, which I know we'll talk about a few years before, gosh, four years before. So very recently, when the story was happening of Christopher Jeffries, it was around the time that our daughter died. So in the film, he's in a prison cell, wondering whether he's being fitted up by the police, Christopher Jeffries. He, he's sitting in, the, in his cell and the fireworks are going off. It's New Year. That was the night that we lost our daughter. Oh my goodness, that was the night. Yeah. So of course we shot that scene and I knew that that was the night that our daughter had died. And Joanna Yates was lost to her family, you know, a daughter, all four. There is this energy and drive to make it the best you can. I mean, you know, again, we're privileged that we're allowed when things connect like that, that really matter to you and have a real importance to you, that you're able to express that in your work is a real gift cannot be underestimated. So you have an opportunity to remember the Joanna Yates, an opportunity to talk about eccentrics, you know, celebrating the eccentric, championing people who are subject to abuses by the press, certain elements of the press and they behaved appallingly, it's yeah, incontrovertible. And I'd lost my daughter. And I'd been asked to do it by Roger Michel, my friend, who I'd worked a lot with in the theatre all through my career, who'd gone to Clifton College itself and was taught by Christopher. So all these, all these planets were sort of really starting to align, you know. And I know that there were other actors, you know, some luminaries of the British theatrical scene were, were being talked about in this role. It was the producer's idea to put Roger and Peter Morgan together. And they were talking about one subject. And then Roger started talking about Christopher Jeffries and this, and, and Peter just got it. He just, right, I've got it. I know what it is. And for him, it was to, and Peter Morgan obviously wrote it, who then wrote The Crown, obviously. That was to do with a man who changed his identity and his appearance so radically. 
despite everything else, that was the thing that he found interesting. Peter works in that way. You get something that he finds a central conundrum that he absolutely is fascinated with and he explores it. In The Crown, it would be the private and the public. That's essentially what it is. Private individuals in a, such an extraordinary life. So then when Roger said, I'm not doing it unless Jason's doing it, which was a mate, which I only found out later on for my CV, but he, he, he wanted me to do it. But then when he asked me, I thought, I can do this. I can really do this. It's every bit of my appetite. And, and it was to prove that it was all fueled by the loss of, it was, it was, it was a grief. It was a grief performance. You know, it was like the power that grief can give you as well as the being crushed by it can give you an energy. Maybe it's to do with, if you do well enough, they'll come back. There's all those sorts of things. I wasn't walking around thinking all these things I've just talked about, but that was deep inside me. And I was and having, that's what came out. Yeah, I was having fun. I was, you know, enjoying it and really working incredibly hard. And, and I suppose, you know, in terms of the impersonation and getting to know, I mean, I, I went to see Christopher. Because a huge responsibility. It's one thing making up a character, yeah. but to being true to, to someone who's still living and, and wanting to respect and honour them. That's a totally different ball game. Yeah, exactly. And it is, he was a victim. Obviously, Joanna's an awful, awful victim. And I think, well, the, the one thing that I can do is to just make sure that I impersonate him really well. There's a sort of, uh, you know, a tribute and an honor to him just to do it well. It's a brilliant piece. It was brilliantly written. And, you know, there's a section in, I can't, I think it's at the end of the first episode, at the beginning of the second, where it just, the camera just goes through, and this is probably Roger, I uh, know, and, uh, uh, and Peter. I can see Roger directing it now. The camera follows, goes into her flat, as it was, when she, and all the police tape and all that. It just, it's just goes and just sees her and her life and what was lost. So in a way, she was looked after by the piece. I can look after Christopher by what I do. And I was thinking all these things, you know, and, and I remember thinking halfway through the shooting of it, we had a, well, I'll come to that in a minute, but just in terms of the personation, I mean, when I met him, I ended up just sort of talking to him and just watching him all the time. And he asked, I said, you know, where did you train? And he did the teach training at uh, Cambridge, I think, that year training course. And then he'd gone to London before that. And I repeated myself. I asked him the same question. He said, well, I've just told you. I told you. And I thought, because I was just too busy watching him that I didn't, you know, wasn't listening to what he said. And then, you know, I, I, I went down on it. I mean, I took photos of him. Um, I, I recorded him and me, me and Roger went down there and went through the script with him and asked him about what he felt at certain points throughout the script. When it came to his dialogue, did he change it at all or was he? No, he was just happy. I mean, the transcripts, I read all the transcripts and the police interviews. They're just fascinating because they're sort of, they're partly mundane. How many cars have you got? Where did you buy them? You know, how many cats have you got? Do you like that cat? Which is your favourite cat? They're sort of fascinating as well, you know. So that was good. And then I remember just watching him and his fingernails and the way he, I just thought that his, he was, this way he was thinking, again, it's like, was that he's thinking, his fingers were thinking. And that he would always have, there's lots of eye contact and you could see him thinking, there was never a wasted word, unlike me, he's just a waffler. Never, a, he was, the, and I thought, he was the sort of keeper of the keys to, to language, you know, as a teacher. He was, he, words were everything to him. He was a bit of an alpha male. He's a victim, funny man, he's got strange hair. All that, what, very, so eloquent, so knowledgeable that he, I thought he's a, this is a man who's strong, you know, not a victim. And also he didn't really tell you much about himself. Why should he? And his sexuality was the least interesting thing I was about him. I wasn't interested. It was more about him as a person. And I say that because of what the press were inferring. Yes, Everybody, yes. we know, it's ridiculous. We're all the same, you know, whatever. And there are other things that are more interesting about people than their sexuality. Are you a kind person? Are you a good person? Are you a good teacher? All those things, for me, I find more interesting yes, than absolutely. so and I've got I've got photographs of me doing his fingers. I just just impersonated him off of video and stuff. 
And then do you walk around and do it in, so, that, so that when you're actually on set, you don't have to think about it That's anymore? That's right. Yeah, yeah. So I'd got lots of armory. And I knew, what, what, one really good thing about Christopher was that, as I said, he had this sort of steady gaze. And I was watching and thinking, this is going to look really good on camera. Because, you know, one of the tricks of, not tricks, but a good thing about film acting in the close-up, you don't really want to move around too much. You want to let the audience come into your mind and you'll see actors that just never blink and you know, you know what they're doing. They decided I'm not going to blink because by not blinking, I can keep my audience. But some other actors don't and they don't have to. And you're equally, equally engaged. But it's a lot to do with that particular person, that's that actor, I think, and the part that they play. Anyway, but Christopher had this thing and I thought, that's going to look good. So I knew that by impersonating him well, it would sort of help in the watching. And his walk and all those sorts of things I got. And yeah, so then I took myself away for three days to my former agent's place. I said, can I go away? Do you mind? So I was there and I had my, I did it the same, did the same thing with Tara Wilson. So I had all the speech, I've just had all the script. I had my ideas about how he moved and talked. And I had a weekend, I went to Mark Spencer's, got loads of food, stuck it in the fridge. And I had three days on my own. That's right. I was planning to go to a, uh, I was planning to go to a, a retreat because he was he liked his own company. He loved being on his own. He had no problem with it. Oh, he's on his own. He's weirdo. He's a weirdo, isn't he? Because he lives on his own. He loved it. He loved he loved literature. He's, he had a group of friends, all this, but he liked being on his own. So I thought I'll do that. I couldn't face going to a monastery for a week. <laughs> um, and, and luckily, I kind of had a hybrid of that. Yeah. So. And I just went through all the speeches and spoke them and spoke them and watching videos of him walking around, doing all these things that, you know, not necessarily people might think are completely stupid and you don't have to share them with people. Just give them the results. I, you know, it's been interesting the last few years, people are really interested in the process and, uh, you know, and people like more, inf- like we're talking about now, they like, how do you do it? You know, you look like you're him. You yeah, I mean, it's yeah. just, it's so effortless and it's so fluid. Yeah, and I was supported by, you know, wonderful costume designer, you know, and I just knew that I got him. So when we came in to prepare for the each day, the night before, I sort of knew it, you know, because I'd, I'd, but then I'd often on the pages that you get for the next day that I'd get the night before, I might write one or two, don't forget, you know, eye contact, fingers thinking, you know, just little notes, just to remind myself, you know, there might be opportunities where you could really do you know, some really good look that you wouldn't want to miss. Get that in there. I'd worked when he was accosted on his front gate by the press. I asked him to mock up a mark it up the night before in the in the rehearsal room with the gate. So I worked out when he touched the gate on what word. You know, we choreographed it exactly as it was in the in the video. Give right, or take. So that's quite technical. Yeah. So that was give or take. It was almost exactly the same. I'm doing that, but at the same time, Johnny Eight is dead. I've lost my own daughter. It's an amazing story. He's a victim. So all these things that really count, so it's not just an impersonation. It's what my ideas are as a person, my compassion, my empathy, my grief, as well as my ambition to do it well. Yes, I want to do good work. Yes, I want to do lots of great parts. I have that ambition, but it, you know, more than that, it's wanting to paint people, recreate them stories. I'd do something else if I wanted to make loads of money and be famous, because you won't make loads of money. You know, I've been lucky, but I'm not a millionaire. You know, you know, it's about people, and that's where I think that it is an art. It is a craft, but it is an art as well. And I'd said to Roger, we were filming a bit where he reads what. The two things really uh, I wanted to mention when we were filming in the, the interview scenes, I thought I'd worked it all out from the transcripts. And then we start shooting this long scene. They were great. Those scenes, you know, long scenes with the brilliant actors that I was working with, you know, suddenly in the middle of one, oh, oh my God, they're trying to fit me up. This is where it is. And I hadn't realized it before. So it happened sort of on camera. The, God, they keep asking me about the bloody car. They're asking me about the car because they think it's moved, because they think that it was me who drove it across the... And I, Jason, hadn't quite pieced that together. 
I knew it logically, but I thought, oh my God, this is it now. So that scene just really shifted. And Roger and the camera moved and said, no, we're going to do another setup there. Let's just go around on him again. Just turn it around again. The scene really happened in the moment. So that was really exciting and incredibly creative. And then the other one was when Christopher reads all the newspapers. So he stays with his friend. He goes to all the newspapers and all the things that were said about him, strange blue hair, funny little man, all those sorts of things. And he's appalled and upset and hurt. And we did it a couple of times. For uh, My instinct was to sort of break down and Roger said, no, she so said, bear it. And that was another thing, written. like a Chris, you know, literally, because he was religious, you bear it. And, and that was something that really helped. How did he respond to your performance? He sort of saw himself being arrested. So he came to set and watched that. And he didn't really say much. Because it's funny, because I think, I mean, I know that you know, my children can send me up. You don't know your own idiosyncrasies. You kind of mm. just think you're normal, which, of course, none of us is normal. So there is a risk that by being truthful, he could think, well, that's how I don't do that. I'm quite yeah, offended. Yeah, absolutely. I said at one point while we were interviewing him and we were going through the script, it was clumsy, really. But I said, why do you keep your nails so long? And he said, do I? So I thought, oh, well, that's interesting. But yes, there is a danger of exposing him. But he was so relieved that his story was told. I heard that he was just, thank you for telling my story. You know, because there were still people while we were filming, you know, we'd say, they say, oh, what are you, what are you doing? What are you filming? And we go, well, about Christopher Jeffries. Oh, that, that's right. That's that guy you killed his... Um, yeah. You know, uh, no, no. No, he didn't. No, he bloody didn't. Harold Wilson, I just actually watched The Crown when it came out. And then I whizzed through your bits again just to, to see you again um, last night. And again, the way you stand and the way you, you've even got your, your sort of neck is a bit sort of set back and the slowness of your movements and the way that you sort of don't quite look at Olivia Coleman and then you do. And again, it's just how you, how you build your character. Because there are a lot of actors who are very good at playing a particular type of person. And I know that I, I interviewed Sky Leo Raz, from, who's the co-creator and lead actor in Fowder. Oh, yeah. And he says, well, I, I act how Leo Raz would react to something. Whereas for you, it's almost like you lose yourself completely and you build yourself back up again from scratch or build your character up from scratch. So it's, it's absolutely everything. It's those little eye movements or the, or the lack of them. It's just your whole demeanor, the whole way you move, the way you walk. I mean, I would think that's very hard. It's just impersonation. You just look at them and it, you become them and you, then you can sort of control it. When you're moving and talking and thinking in that character, it's sort of there. And then you just got to make sure you play the scene so that you use the impersonation. So it's not just impersonation. Play the scene, be affected by the other characters, the other actors. That's really the ambition is to be thinking about enjoying being in another person, but also being present in the scene and play the scene. Even with McDonald and Dodds and other shows, anything I do, there might be a model of somebody else there. I did a thing in the summer called The Catch, which is just a sort of thriller. I don't get to play a guy who's, and apart from, you know, like Plymouth accent, I wanted it to be me, you know. Yeah, so I, I went for a walk with a friend of mine this morning. She said, well, have you seen Jason Watkins in The Catch? And I thought, no, no, I haven't watched that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I will be watching that next. Yeah, I do. The career is mad because it's so It's so varied. Going. It's so rich and varied. I'm going to actually just list a few things that I've seen you in now because they're all so different. They know that you're Simon Harwood in W1A, satire of the media workplaces and everything's brilliant, even though no one's said anything. Trollied, your supermarket manager, Gavin Strong, with Jane Horrocks, um, who you were at RADA with in Des. You're Brian Masters, the biographer to David Tennant's serial killer. That was very gritty and uncomfortable Yeah, and, an, a, and a real person again. And I met him and I enjoyed playing him. I thought he was a remarkable person. And yeah, Yes, that, because yeah. he was in a real conundrum because he was almost sort of, he was fascinated and yet, and yet horrified. Yeah, and he was in danger of being a vehicle for this weird man's thinking. And, you know, by exposing him, he was almost giving him a voice, you know. So all these things were whizzing around in his head, yeah. Fascinating. 
Yeah. And then McDonald and Dodds, I really enjoy watching them and you're understated and the person who always cracks the case, great Bristol accent. And, uh, and then the Nativity films, which of course we love. And I watched Nativity 2 on Saturday, the way that you lift your chin and you puff up your chest and you're so sort of dramatic. And, and as soon as you do those things, I think, yeah, that is what a music teacher does. But if someone told me, what does a music teacher do? I wouldn't be able to figure it out. No, I mean, those, I mean, they're all improvised, those films. I mean, that's the joy of them. They're improvised on camera. So you can just make it up. I was working over the last weekend and my makeup person said, oh, we just love them. And my daughter, can you just say, not only are you, <laughs> not only are you poor, you're also stupid. <laughs> so, and they're all made, they're all made up on the spot. And that, that was tricky because you thought, oh, am I crossing a line here? But of course, you know, they're the ones that people remember. Um, but yeah, that, that was just all joy, those days. I mean, I, th there is a fourth one, which I couldn't, it was too much for me. We've done it, you know, but they're yeah. so enduring and... Oh, so well loved because, they I, mean, they are, they, I mean, I was sitting there on my own, you know, watching what's supposedly really for, for children, but I loved it. It was two hours of joy. Everyone goes through an activity, don't they? So De Debbie, you know, Debbie, De I did a film, Confetti, before those with Debbie, which is improvised, which I, I really enjoyed that part, playing a a wedding planner with uh, Vincent Franklin, who was my on-screen husband, and uh, that mine Freeman. And I made lo lots of friends there, Olivia and Martin. You know, they're all Steve Mang, and, you know, they're all sort of mates who, who I met on that job. So, and then we, we went on to the nativity films, but they just keep coming round and round. So each generation seems to hand it on to their sister and, or brother, or it just goes on and on, you know. And so it's really nice to have that, you know, went on holiday in Italy and a, a family rushed over the piazza and, they said, we've come all the way from Bolton in a car, in our car, and we've had the nativity films on a loop ever since. We've <laughs> just parked the car, walked across the piazza, and there you were. Oh, that's lovely. Toughest character to crack? The toughest, well, I never achieved it. I did a play called Bingo down in Chichester, which was a nightmare. And I had a bit, of, I had a real wobble. I said a bit of a breakdown, actually, frankly. Couldn't deal with it. I just pitched it all wrong. This is many, this is just before Moore died. So I wasn't working very much and the play came up and I loved Edward Bond. I thought I should do it. And I got there and I, I thought, I can't do this. I'm miscast. And I felt trapped one weekend and really had a massive anxiety attack. And uh, yeah, was really struggling for a good week and uh, didn't really want to be there. That was hard. Did you do it? I did it. Yeah, I did it. And then I found my feet once we started performing. What was the character? He was a guy who starts the play and he has this 10-page monologue about farming in the Elizabethan era. How interesting is that? Well, um, no. How know. can you make that interesting? And I thought, I'm just a vehicle for this play. I can't get my head around it. I was scrambling around trying to make sense of it, but I, I just couldn't find it. And my lovely, great, late friend, Gillian Diamond, who's the casting director, she said, you've got to find a way of enjoying it. So I did. And I was having problems with like one of the actors in it as well, who I felt very overwhelmed by. And, but then we started talking about football and then we were fine. That was a real wobble. Doing plays is stressful. It really is. And I think throughout my younger days doing that, there was always some sort of real, whether it was a crisis or not, I don't know. But, you know, I'd often, I remember when I was young, you know, I'd have a drink on a Friday night towards the end of rehearsal. And then it would sort of, as a kind of, part of my technique because you would see the I don't recommend this you'd see your character differently because you've been so wrapped up in it yes and the nerves and you know and I wasn't a good um, husband to my first wife Caroline and it was all part of the fear of performing it's the thrill of performing but it's the fear of performing yeah. and you do things you make connections that you shouldn't it's a hard life and you, you learn how to we were saying early on, you when you you were singing, you know, you learn how to temper your anxieties, and and I like to think that those anxieties and difficulties make me the actor that I am, and I wouldn't be the same actor if I was just I found a breeze. I always find it difficult. I find it stimulating and so rewarding, but also there's an amount of nerves and an amount of expectation. Perhaps you can be a perfectionist when you get older because, in a way, you've got so much knowledge. You could do it this way, that way. Oh, I remember, what should I do it when I did that part? And really, it's that's there's a dangerous area, really. The good thing is just to trust your instinct and enjoy 
what you've built up instinctively over all these years. And off of that, working with Judy Dench, she worked on stage with her. It was very conventional. It wasn't this weird, sort of crazy, brilliant. Livy's the same. They're very similar. That Livy's very alive. All her emotions are very present when she works. And she enjoys it. And she takes a few risks. And she attacks it. But it's conventional. You can get too cluttered and think too much about it. Think less and free your imagination. Let all this talent that you built, or let all the, the things that you become good at, let them out the door, you know. Yeah. In Nativity too, at the very end, there's that beautiful dedication to Maud Watkins, the brightest star in the sky. And I was just wondering if you feel up to telling us about what happened to Maud. Yeah. So Maud was our second child. So and she was born in 2008. So Bessie was four and Maud was two and a half. So in, in the winter leading up to Christmas 2010, Maud got a cold and I was worried that it had gone to her chest. We both were worried, Clara and I. So I took her to the GP and they said, and she was, you know, she was sort of coughing and a sore throat. And she said, oh, yes, I think, yeah, I think it's just sort of croup or it's, you know, she's got a sort of throat infection. Here's some antibiotics. Take those and see how you, how you get on. And I was thinking, mm, and I was still rather worried. So I left, walked out the door and she said, no, wait a minute. Why don't you go down to the drop-in A&E? So we went to the drop-in A&E in the liberal hospital where they gave her some steroids to ease the constriction in her throat, some medicines and sent us home and look out, said, look out in 24 hours when the steroids wear out and see how she is. So we were sort of gearing ourselves up for this 24 hour period. And then, so the following afternoon, so which was New Year's Eve, I'd had a little nap in the afternoon, I remember, which, which I rarely, I do, I went through a period of not having a nap at all after, after this, but I, I'd, I, I am now in a way, I do not, which might indicate something, but, and Clara woke me up and just said, I, you know, Maud is not well, you know, so, and she was struggling to breathe and uh, was pale, a bit floppy. So we decided to take her to the A&E and we thought we'd get her there quickly then. This is about sort of four or five in the afternoon. Uh, so we drove a breakneck speed down to then she was trying to keep her awake. So I was driving, Clara, Clara had Maudie on her lap, trying to keep her awake. And she was getting listless and her eyes were rolling and, so we got to the hospital and rushed in, into triage. She was given gas and air and uh, he, he, into the same A&E department. And her temperature started coming down. She was calmer. And they said, oh, it's croup. It's definitely croup. And I, we think it'd be better if she went home because she's best, you know, she's calmer now. And she may benefit from being at home more than being in hospital and feeling the sort of alienation difficulties of being in hospital. So we went, oh, we, I was relieved. And so we, we took her home and uh, they said, you know, look out for, again, for what happens in 24 hours, steroids. So we put in, in her cot, um, doing as they said, not too hot, not too cold. And then, so that was New Year's Eve. And then in the morning on New Year's Day, and we popped in to see her and then we, you know, went to sleep and Maudie and Bessie shared a bedroom, a room, bedroom yeah. And, um, so we were in bed and, and Bessie came in and said, I just can't, I can't wait, Maud. So part of you think, oh, well, she's because she's tired after the yesterday. But of course, you know, you know, I knew that I remember walking in a sort of, sort of slow motion, but thinking, oh, she could be dead, couldn't she? But she won't be, I'll be fine. But with this sort of surreal, you just can't, you know. Dread, not... yeah. Sort of really domestic and ordinary, but also had dread. Anyway. It was weird. And then I walked in and she was dead, you know, so dead in the court. Alas. So, yeah, and then it was just chaos and it was like sort of hell, really. And your, your brain, you want time to go backwards. You, want, you can't believe it's happened. And that, that sort of continues in the grieving process, actually. But at that moment, it, well, it was just awful. And the police came and the ambulance came and... And we didn't think, yeah, I don't know how we slept that night. And the future seemed inconceivable. We would be able to live a 
live at all, I well, guess. Yeah, what's the point? You know? Yeah. It's absolutely the worst thing that can hmm. happen to so, anybody. To it's anybody, something yeah. that, you know, no one, yeah. no one should have to go through. Um, no. It's just, it is the worst. Yeah, and traumatizing and just, you feel like you are in, the world's just completely changed and everything you thought was, you, everything is different and cruel and hard and you feel victimized, beaten up and that you're in a pit, dark pit that you can't get out of. You really do. And you we didn't get out of bed for days and days and you just don't think you can continue. And then you can think about your other children and, and then gradually, you know, you get a little tiny chink, you know, of something that isn't desperation, you know, even something normal and people bring you things like soup and, you know, things like that really do count. Let me tell you, really things like arriving with food, someone sitting on the end of the bed and just talking bollocks to you is really good, you know, to these things. And we watched a lot of e-news entertainment, which was rubbish, but it was necessary just for distraction. For parents who are going through this kind of thing now, having been in that pit, and I'm sure you go back there sometimes, what advice or wisdom could you share? Well, you know, we made this documentary and since then, I've been talking to half a dozen people, really, talking about this very thing. Thinking about a couple in Australia who just lost their two and a half year to sepsis. They just can't understand how or why it's happened. So I've been, we're trying to, we're talking them through it and trying to get them as much help as we can. We're just talking on Zoom. The trauma of it, and by trauma, it's a very easy word to, throw around, isn't it? Oh, it's terribly traumatic. Or Trauma is where you have a physical reaction to something that's awful. That is, your body's in a terrible place. Your mind's equally confused and disorientated. It's a very physical feeling. And those feelings, which are, I know if people are listening to this and they've lost someone, will we'll know, is you, your heartache. You, it's a physical ache, isn't you it? You understand what heartache is because your heart hurts. And you feel the physical absence of the child, your child's hand in yours. It, it, it tingles, it, it's not there. And you, things like that. And your overall feelings of being overwhelmed and beaten up and desperate. Those physical feelings do subside. They do. That's a fact. And knowing that can help, I think. I, the best example that I've heard and what I always say is that grief, uh, your loss of your child is so, it's like a huge dot in front of you. It's like a big sphere right in front of you that's dominating you. You could even looking down on you and you can't see beyond it. You can't see through it. And slowly, in terms of the trauma of it, it gets smaller. It's still in the center. It's still there. But you can start to look round and see your other children, what you might make for tea that night, or your other friends, and start to just begin to focus a bit on them. Then the next day might get bigger again, but gradually it goes smaller again. It goes, and the grief goes. You have three days of of desperation. I'm back again. I've gone back again. And this is what it's yeah. been like. I'm going to go keep going. But then you'll have a half a day of feeling, okay, I can breathe. And then another full day, and then you'll be back again. It goes up and down. And it's like a sort of jazz thing that you can't control. You have to let life just carry you along a bit. And don't be hard on yourself. You can't, you can't solve it. You, you, no. Particularly if you're a man. Yeah, that must be one of the hardest things in life. So many things are fixable. And this yeah. is the one th Thing you that can't is, fix it. No. And you have to accept that and you have to let that go. And don't be too hard on yourself. Breathing, talking, don't even have to get up. All those things, you're doing well. You know, that's 
amazing that you are, you know, you don't expect too much of yourself. Don't expect too much of other people. And if somebody pisses you off, fine. You can even tell them if you want. You know, you, you're allowed to do anything you want. Yeah. You have a pass not to go out. You don't have to do that if you don't want to. You have the right to do it because you've had such a terrible shock, you know, the, the worst shock. But then I'd also recommend when you feel you're able is to go for a walk somewhere that's familiar. Or even if somebody takes you in the car and dumps you in some way with a friend, with your partner, or with a friend, with your dog, at some point. So you just begin to look at the world. It's a beautiful day looking out your window. The blossoms are extraordinary, aren't they? That started to happen to us, you know, because that was around that time. Yes. Uh, so, you know, three months, you know, the blossoms coming out. So, and you can breathe and the, the air becomes cooler and, and you can feel it in your lungs. So that trauma, and you, some people, you know, they can't be, you can't be believe, feeling what I'm feeling because this is the worst thing. So, well, yeah, it is. We did feel it. And people do, and they will always do that. But what I'm telling you is that that trauma bit, you know, we laugh, we have fun. 12 years down the line, we have fun, we laugh. Remember our daughter very much. And, you know, we're still campaigning. We're still working with her mind, but, and we miss her desperately and reevaluate her all the time and remember things about her all the time, uh, new things that we hadn't remembered. So the, another thing I'd say is that do remember, which is the thing that I've learned since the documentary, is that I've, I've got to remember happy memories of Maud because I was still, I think, wrapped up in the trauma of it. And it's only now, since the documentary, and actually, frankly, seeing her on full screen, being funny and people in the, when we had a screening laughing, of course, there was just wonderful. And enjoying that, looking at that, you know, and finding happy photographs and not feeling guilty and not feeling that it's all dreadful. As I was saying about emotion and about like the Christopher Jeffers, that, you know, when you're in a sort of state of emotion, things happen. Is that uh, over the weekend after we got so overwhelmed by social people contacted on social media and that was a wonderful thing that happened. And then I thought, oh, some people were sending me pictures of their children and I was coming out saying, oh, they're just beautiful and I'm really sorry. And I'm I, very happy. I really enjoyed doing, helping, you know, there, there was a nice connection there. And I suddenly thought, oh, why don't people, I said, why don't you just send in your photographs? If you got, if you feel you want to, put it in and put a hashtag, we carry you with us. Because that's what, one of the things you do is you carry your child with you. And so we got all these things coming in and people sharing the photographs of them. And I said, they've got to be happy memories. Early on, it's very difficult. But Clara's just been amazing. You know, she's, I think she's, you know, she's been my strength really, you know, through all the difficult time, isn't it? When I was 17, a friend of mine died. And when my mother met his mother a few weeks later in town doing some shopping, she went and gave her a hug. And, and the mum said, you have no idea. People are walking on the other side of the road to me now. And I understand that they don't want to, to deal with it, but it's so lovely that you have. What advice would you give to friends of families who are going through this kind of trauma? Clara felt very much like that, that she didn't want to be seen as the widow or the, you know, the victim on the other side of the road where black as she is, look over there and that's her, she's lost a child. And of course it's people and they don't want to upset you, but they don't want to put their foot in it. But at the same time you're grieving and then suddenly you're also isolated. So that's. Yeah, it's, it's the worst thing. And the thing is, they, well, I mustn't talk about it because it's going to remind her. Well, the we're thinking about them all the time. It means so much for somebody to come up and say, I was so sorry to hear about your daughter. It must be terrible. I've. I'm so sorry. Is there anything I can do? I don't, I can't find the words. It's, I'm useless at it, but I just want you to know that we're thinking of you. That's it. If you can find, because you think, oh God, I've got to find the right words. I would say something wrong. And I do it myself. You know, I should be brilliant at it. But sometimes I think, oh gosh, you know, have I said, and you can't, you know, just to have contact and to, to, just literally to say that, oh, you know, Jane, or what, I'm, I'm so sorry. I don't know how to, I don't, can't find the words, but I, I feel so, I feel for you so much. Is there anything I can do? That's it. Just to know that you feel this support 
And it's not about you and your grieving. It's about them. It's about the, the parents who've lost their child. Yeah. Remember that it's about them. You may not say the right thing and you can go home and beat yourself up about it, but it's nothing to what they're feeling. So it's always good to take a breath. It, strangers do it, you know, strangers do it to me or people I've worked, when I go to work, you know, they'll say, listen, no, it's a long time ago, but I really, or I watched a documentary, I re I'm so sorry. It means so much because your child's name is mentioned and it reaffirms that they existed, they were with you and it's impor so important. Yeah. The documentary, which um, if anyone hasn't seen it, you can find it on ITVX now and it's Jason and Clara in memory of Maudie. Absolutely beautiful documentary you know and it's so selfless of the two of you because it's going over everything in in minute detail and as something for other grieving families to watch you are helping so many people and then the other side of that is raising awareness of sepsis i had heard the name of the word sepsis but didn't know anything about it and and then i went on to the uk sepsis trust website and in 2012 so that was a year later, still only 27%, there was a percentage had heard of sepsis. And that's now, for thanks to people like you, in 2019, it's up to 76%. But it's so common. And then there was that other statistic, which you said about you know, five people every hour in the UK are dying of sepsis. It's so common. And yet people don't think to look for it. Because it's the immune system attacking itself, a blood test, I guess, isn't going to show that up, is it? I mean, what would show... There, there are tests that you can do that can show the presence of an infection and the likelihood of, their, of sepsis. So there is a particular test that you can do, yeah. It is very difficult to diagnose. This is why the numbers are what they are. This is why we're saying, why have we heard about this before so much? Because previously it would be the presenting symptoms that were put on the death certificate, so pneumonia or whatever it might be, or COVID. But... Actually, in most COVID cases, sepsis was the final element to it, sadly. So it is a difficult thing to diagnose. But at the UK Sepsis Trust, we say the first thing is what you want to ask is, could it be sepsis? So anyone who's had an infection could get it. Okay, so don't want to be alarmist about it. But certainly within infants and the aged who are more, more vulnerable, you have to ask the question, could it be sepsis and have that test? And that notion of it being entertained so is the first thing you look for. Unfortunately, because of the way the NHS is structured and to do with trusts, et cetera, and, and financial constraints, it's difficult to implement that thinking. And you'll see in the documentary, there's a simulation program that I visit where you can program yes. a, the child to display symptoms of sepsis. It's available to all the healthcare professionals in that trust, but there isn't time within their busy schedules for them to attend it which for a parent who's lost a child to sepsis is anathema and yeah. frankly enraging. Yes. So something has to change in the way that we look at sepsis, but the way that we, we view particularly infants when they're presented in A&E and how we shift our thinking into incorporating sepsis. It's difficult when a child comes in and what, do you, what are you looking for? But the signs of sepsis are there for us to see you know, as parents or as friends of people with children or even work colleagues, you know, I work with a, a nurse on, a, she, he, when you do a production, each show you have a, a nurse on set and she had saved somebody who, on a, a crew member who was get, going listless and was eyes were rolling, uh, having a stridor, which is what Maudie uh, displayed. And she took him down to the hospital and he had sepsis and saved his life. So, you know, knowing those signs and look on the UK Sepsis Trust website, uh, you know, it's, it, it's uh, feeling faint, you know, uh, feeling like you could die, breathing difficulties, not passing water for 24 hours, cold to the touch, feeling limp, all those, those things. Uh, and they're listed in, in the website. They're, those are these, essentially the ones you're looking for. So if any of those symptoms are displayed, check it, Sepsis. Just do it. Because you've only got a certain amount of time in which you can diagnose and act upon it. Otherwise, it's too late. And that's what happened with Maud. It was too late for her. And there are other times, like a case that happened at our local hospital in the same week that the documentary was shown. In our local hospital, in the Royal Free, a boy was 
presented at Bainey three times and was told to go home. And then during that third visit, uh, he, he passed away. Oh, my goodness. And that, so. That's now. That's now. That's 12 years after Maud died. I don't want to be alarmist about it. It's still, you know, rare. But the numbers speak for themselves. Yeah. 250,000 cases per year, 50,000 deaths. We think around 20,000 should be preventable. And you're also a patron of Child Bereavement UK, a fantastic charity yeah. that helps children, young people, families when either a child dies or when a child grieves. You're working so tirelessly so that others don't suffer the same, the same fate, which is, you know, quite extraordinary. It just must be incredibly hard, all of it. Yes, it is. But I mean, I think, I mean, the Child Bereavement UK is, is an exceptional charity and it just works so tirelessly. I'm so proud to be a patron and they, they're so sensitive and caring and energised and they helped us with the special screening of the, of the documentary, for example, amongst many, many other things. And, you know, you just ring, ring them up, basically. Um, if, if you need their help or you can talk to them if you feel somebody else needs them. They have a wide range of, of things. They're, they're, they're really wonderful, but we're only echoing, reflecting what we ourselves received at the beginning when we were on our start of our journey. Is that how your paths crossed? Gosh, I'm trying to think when that was. I think, yeah, we worked with our local support group, which is called the Slow Group, which are very good, a local in, in North London. They run by bereaved parents where you can share stories uh, of your loss with them. And that's a wonderful mechanism in itself. But I think they asked me to come and do a film just to talk about loss, Charbery in UK, which was a one more minute. It was called, What Would You Say If You Had One More Minute With Your Child? I mean, you know, it was, oh. it is a tough one, but the film did very well. And then I got to meet everybody. I'm trying to think when this was, it must've been six years ago, seven years ago. So, you know, been been there a while and they just wanted me to be part of it. And, and I'm so delighted that they did. And, but they need support like all these charities. We are taking a lot of things that we learned from them, taking a lot of things that we've learned ourselves and people who'd lost children who came to see us in the first few weeks. What we've been able to do yeah. is do it on a bigger scale to more people. It's wonderful of you and Clara to be doing that and to have been so honest and to have shared so openly. So thank you. Thank you. And thank you also. The huge amount of joy you give to so many with all these amazing performances that you do and for your time today. Thank you so much, Jason. Thank you. Lovely to talk to you, Katie. You've been listening to Bandwidth Conversations. Thanks to Anna B, Head of Marketing, to Matthew Passy and all of the Podcast Consultant, to Bagawai for the music, to the Money Maze podcast. Thank you for listening. Any feedback, please email me, katie at bandwidthconversations.com. Please sign up on our website, www.bandwidthconversations.com, so we can notify you about new podcast releases. We hope to see you again soon. Mm-hmm.